A History of Central Banking and the Enslavement of Mankind by Stephen Mitford Goodson. Chapter 8 The Banking Crisis. I'm afraid that the ordinary citizen will not like to be told that the banks can, and do, create and destroy money. The amount of money in existence varies only with the actions of the banks increasing and decreasing deposits and bank purchases. And they who control the credit of a nation direct the policy of governments and hold in the hollow of their hands the destiny of the people. Reginald McKenna, former Chancellor of the Exchequer. Historical Overview Banking crises generally take three forms. One, where an individual bank collapses because of a lack of confidence and a subsequent withdrawal of deposits. Two, a bank run when a number of banks fail simultaneously, and three, when the entire system implodes. In the 18th century, banking crises were confined to only those countries which had central banks and practiced usury, viz. England, the Netherlands, and Sweden. In 1710, the Swordblade Bank, in competition with the Bank of England, took over a portion of the national debt in exchange for Swordblade shares. The following year, the South Sea Company did a similar deal and in 1720 took over the remaining government debt in exchange for its overvalued shares. The South Sea Company was nothing but a shell and had no trading assets. On the 24th of September, 1720, the Swordblade Bank went into liquidation and by the end of that year, the shares of the South Sea Company had lost almost 90% of their peak value of £1,000 per share. In 1763, after the end of the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763, vessels or bills issued by Dutch banker Lindert Peter de Neufel could not be redeemed and precipitated a run on banks in the Netherlands, Germany, and Sweden. On the 10th of June, 1772, the London banking houses of Neal, James, Fordyce, and Down, which had been indulging in speculation on a massive scale by shorting East India Company stock, crashed after it could no longer cover its losses by raiding customers' deposits. 22 significant banks and almost all private banks in Scotland were forced into liquidation. The contagion then spread to Amsterdam. Many banks there experienced a liquidity crisis, including Clifford & Sons, which went bankrupt. Henceforth, almost all banking crises would be precipitated as a result of the central banking model which permits private banks to create money as an interest-bearing debt and then destroy it once it has been repaid. Thus, the first two panics in the United States in 1792 and 1796 to 1797 were induced by the first bank of the United States when it purposefully withheld credit in order to cause a slump. A similar financial disaster and subsequent depression were planned and executed by the Rothschild-owned Second Bank of the United States in 1819, while England was also afflicted by artificially created panics in 1825 and 1847. In the Panic of 1825, 66 banks were forced to close their doors. There was another banking panic in the United States in 1857 as a result of a fabricated shortage of gold and the failure of the Ohio Life Insurance and Trust Company. As has already been observed in Chapter 4, once the United States was forced onto the gold standard in January 1873, a pattern of more frequent and intensified banking panics evolved. Less than eight months later, in September of that year, the United States was premeditatedly plunged into a recession which lasted for four years. The ensuing panics of 1884, 1890, 1890 to 91, 1893 to 94, 1897, 1903, and 1907 were all deliberately orchestrated so as to drive the American people into a state of confusion and despair. After 40 years of planned chaos, of boom and bust, as well as a targeted media campaign of disinformation, the population meekly capitulated and the banking conspirators' dream of a United States central bank was realized on the 23rd of December, 1913. After the Great Depression, which had been contrived by the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank, a relative period of stability supervened until the 1990s when an ever-increasing number of countries suffered economic crises and financial difficulties. Finland, Sweden, Venezuela, Indonesia, South Korea, Thailand, Russia, Argentina, Ecuador, and Uruguay. The Banking Crisis, 2007 and onward. The seeds of the current banking crisis were sown when the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which prohibited bank-holding companies from owning financial institutions and separated banks from investment houses, was abrogated on the 12th of November, 1999. At the time of the promulgation of the original act, Senator Carter Glass, a former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury and one of its authors, remarked that, With a gun, a man can rob a bank. With a bank, a man can rob the world. It was deemed towards the end of President Clinton's administration that everyone had the right to own a home, and for this purpose, the Department of Housing and Development initiated a program called National Homeownership Strategy Partners in the American Dream. 
In order to attract as many new homeowners as possible, credit standards and regulations were relaxed, and government allowed borrowers a tax credit of $8,000. Low teaser interest rates were offered for the first two years, but with substantially higher rates being payable thereafter. Between 1998 and 2006, house prices rose by 124%, but two years later, in 2008, a drop of 20% was recorded. In contrast to rising prices, the affordability of housing showed a declining trend. Between 1980 to 2000, the ratio of the cost of an average house to median household income was 3.0, but by 2006, it had risen to 4.6. Credit fall swaps, which were intended to hedge or speculate against credit risks, increased hundredfold between 1998 and 2008 to $47 trillion and had a notional value of $683 trillion. In order to fuel the property boom, innovative financial products were developed such as collateralized debt obligations. Mortgages of varying degrees of quality were bundled up and, after having been assessed fraudulently as it transpired by rating agencies as being AAA in many cases, were sold on to gullible investors. In order to further this culture of greed, the shadow banking sector, which includes investment banks and hedge funds, and whose total funds were believed at that time to have amounted to in excess of $100 trillion, aggressively marketed these products, notwithstanding the fact that by June 2007, 39% of all home loans did not meet the underwriting standards of any issuer. The balloon finally went up when Lehman Brothers was declared bankrupt on the 15th of September 2008. A rescue package was hastily assembled and Congress approved a sum of $700 billion for a troubled asset relief program, TARP. But this was only the tip of the iceberg, as the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank has since granted over $16 trillion worth of assistance to domestic and foreign banks. According to the memoir of Neil Barofsky, Inspector General of the TARP, the final figure may well exceed $24 trillion. It therefore comes as no surprise that, during the period 2008 to 2013, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank has expanded its balance sheet by 500% to $5 trillion in order to prop up an insolvent banking sector with its Ponzi-like quantitative easing program. While in similar vein, between 2007 and 2012, the balance sheets of the six largest Western banks have been inflated by 36.4% from $10.7 trillion to $14.6 trillion. Causatum. In the aftermath of this financial crisis, attempts have been made to remedy what is in essence an insoluble problem. The Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act passed into law on the 21st of July 2010 contains numerous regulations designed to promote accountability, financial stability, and transparency. 200 pages of the act are devoted to mortgage reform and include higher underwriting standards and an obligation on mortgage originators to ensure that borrowers have the ability to repay their loans. The scientists of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision have proposed higher levels of capital and liquidity ratios in the hope that these measures will strengthen the banking sector. Regrettably, they will in all probability have the opposite outcome and will only cause the money supply to shrink further and thereby deepen the recession. What is not understood by most bankers and economists is that the only method available for keeping the economy running is to sink further into debt at interest, as debt-based money is the only source of our means of exchange. Hence, the persistent mantra that growth must be maintained at all costs, because if all loans were to be repaid, the money supply would vanish and we would be reduced to exchanging goods and services with banknotes and barter. In the current situation, a worldwide debt cancellation would therefore not be out of place if the money supply could be replaced by state bank-created, interest-free, and debt-free money. The underlying reason why the developed world, which has in the past produced superior, long-lasting products, has been partially deindustrialized is so that inferior goods have to be continually produced by third world countries in order to fuel the growth syndrome. It also highlights the absurdity of the insistence that Europe needs economic growth when its indigenous population is shrinking. This policy of deliberately planned obsolescence and forced growth also has very deleterious effects on the environment. As will be observed in the final section, the collapse in female fertility rates in the developed world, which is a direct consequence of usury, will lead to the extinction of civilization. In conclusion, it may be stated that the principal hidden purpose of the banking crisis is to generate a general feeling of desperation and an acclamation for a solution such as a world central bank, a similar situation which prevailed in the United States during the late 19th century when banking panics were being artificially created in preparation for the imposition of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. Whether the parasitic bankers will achieve this objective is open to doubt, as the host may well have vanished by then. The Great Depression of the 21st Century 
One of the primary causes of the ballooning debt bubble has been the suicidal policy of globalization and free trade, which has resulted in the aforementioned partial deindustrialization of the United States, United Kingdom, and Europe. The relocation of industries to third world countries has precipitated a reduction in the manufacturing base of the developed world, structural unemployment of a permanent nature, and a widening trade gap. In an attempt to maintain their falling standards of living, consumers in these affected countries have been forced to take on increasing levels of personal debt. Thus, in the United States, during the 1980s, $2.37 of private debt was required to produce $1 of growth in GDP. In the 1990s, the figure rose to $2.99, and in the 2000s, there was a dramatic increase to $5.67 for each incremental dollar of economic growth, a level which will soon become untenable. A further aggravating factor is that the rising cost of extracting energy, also known as the Energy Returns on Energy Invested, EROEI, is rapidly approaching a tipping point. According to a Tullip Preben report, in 1990, the theoretical cost of energy would have been 2.43% of GDP, and in 2010, it almost doubled to 4.7% of GDP. It is predicted to rise to 9.6% of GDP by 2020 and to 15% by 2030. This decline in energy returns, which will cause the widespread closure of mines and industries and adversely affect agriculture, predicates a very substantial drop in living standards. Escalating extraction costs of energy are not the only predicament facing mankind. During the past 100 years, water consumption has quadrupled and continues to rise. Currently, 1.6 billion people are facing absolute water scarcity and, according to a recent U.S. government report in June 2014, Global demand for water will exceed supply by 40% by 2030. However, the factor which overrides all these macroeconomic considerations is the collapse in the birth rate of the developed world. At the turn of the 20th century, the white population of the world numbered 590 million, or 36% of its 1.65 billion total. In 2016, although that number had increased absolutely to 1 billion, its relative share of the world's population of 7.5 billion has shrunk to 13.3%. Two fratricidal and pointless world wars over the maintenance of the usury system set this catastrophic decline in motion. The following table of fertility rates reveals the inevitability and the near mathematical certainty that, by 2100, most of the whites and a large portion of the Asian peoples of Northeast Asia will have died out. The first column of the table of fertility rates above lists all countries with a population in excess of 100 million while the following table lists the populations of the major white and far East Asian countries. The accepted fertility rate for the replacement of a population is 2.11. Thus, the white, Chinese, and Japanese populations will be severely depleted within three generations, and, unless the fertility rate substantially increases, will face eventual extinction. From the above table, it may be noted that a fertility rate of 1.3 would take 80 to 100 years to reverse, which is well-nigh impossible while historically, a fertility rate of 1.9 has never been reversed. Moreover, the sharpness of the decline in the white population is concealed by virtue of the fact that large numbers of non-whites, who have much higher rates of fertility, are included in these fertility rates. The percentage of whites in the following major countries is as follows. Brazil, 48. Germany, 88. United Kingdom, 86. Australia, 85. France, 85. Russia, 81. Canada, 80. United States, 65. Much reliance has been placed on China, which it is hoped will save the world economy from its demise, but the fertility rates of neighboring territories of Hong Kong, population 7 million, of 0 0.97, and Taiwan, population 23.3 million, of 1.1, are indicative of a declining trend, and are matched by mainland China's fertility rate of 1.05. These declining fertility rates in China are also underpinned by the one-child policy of the Chinese government, which has been in effect since 1979. It is anticipated that China will achieve zero population growth in the near future. Since World War II, ever-increasing numbers of married women in the Western world, diluted by the malevolent propaganda of feminism and gender equality, have been forced to seek employment so that their families can pay the ever-increasing amount of interest necessary in order to make ends meet. Most of this interest is accrued on mortgage loans, i.e. on money which banks have created out of nothing. The direct result of this iniquitous financial system has been the undermining of a normal family life and a dramatic reduction in female fertility. According to Aaron Russo, the Rockefellers were behind this diabolical scheme which was created to draw women into the income tax net, place their children in school at an early age where they could be indoctrinated, destabilize society, and set up the new world order.
In this manner, the link between usury and demographic decline has been established. Even if the usury system should be abolished in its entirety within the next 5 to 10 years, these trends will not be easily reversed over both the short and medium term. If usury remains intact, then the world must brace itself for a depression similar to the Dark Ages, which will last for many centuries. In the preceding chapters, it has been proven conclusively that state banking and the sovereign issue of a nation's money supply are the only means for the provision of a natural order of harmony, peace, and prosperity founded on the ethnic independence of all peoples. The past 300 years, notwithstanding numerous technological advancements, have witnessed a progressive deterioration in Western and European standards of civilization. The excessive concentration of power and wealth, based exclusively on dishonest banking methods, has enabled a tiny minority of criminal bankers to control the media and educational processes, and thereby to brainwash a mindless and atomized humanity, deluded by the spurious comforts of democracy and materialism into suicidal practices of savage, bloody, and pointless wars, central banking, and cultural degradation, which will eventually result in its demographic extinction.